So I want to welcome you all today to our Lunch with League. Uh, we are very pleased to have our first third Thursday Lunch with League of the new year. And I am Carol Watts, the uh, president of the League of Women Voters of San Jose, Santa Clara. And has anybody noticed that today is a palindrome? This is 12121. And I want to uh, wish everyone a happy new year. And I think this year is, of course, as everyone knows, we thought ever 2021 might be a little quieter and we were looking forward to leaving 2020 behind. Uh, but I think we're all reminded now that we are never going to stop making democracy work. Before I introduce our speaker today, I'd like to mention uh, an upcoming event. We're having a program planning meeting on uh, February the 20th, and that's when you can let us know what you think our local and state leagues should be working on. We really value your input. This process shows how the League of Women Voters is a true grassroots organization. For example, we could recommend that LWV California study a, a conduct a study or, a re, or an update study on a subject that we care about. Maybe we want to reevaluate the Brown Act. And if other leagues in the state agree, this could result in a study and update our existing state position. And then we can take action because that's how the league works. It is so easy to find all of the positions that we've worked on hard through the years. And this is just one of the reasons that I really love the League of Women Voters. We're so pleased to have Rick Callender with us today. And I think it's very appropriate that we have him speak with us in the week of the anniversary of Martin Luther King's death. He's speaking on environmental justice matters. Welcome, Rick. And uh, this is a topic that is very close to our heart. We have strong positions on natural resources and climate change and water, as well as strong social justice issues. And we also have a strong commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. While Mr. Callender is speaking, you may ask questions by entering them into chat. And if we have time and you have the inclination, you could also ask your own question and we can uh, turn on your, uh, your audio. Rick Callender is the CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Water District He's also the president of the California-Hawaii State Conference of the NAACP. He's worked for Valley Water since 1996, serving most recently as the chief of external affairs as he led Valley Water's efforts in strategic external communications to the media, community, and the public. He also oversaw all government relations efforts on local, regional, state, and federal levels, as well as public policies that directly affect Valley Water. Prior to joining the district, he worked as a special assistant to the former city of San Jose Mayor Susan Hammer, as a field campaign organizer for the California Democratic Party, as a congressional fellow for the United States House of Representatives. I bet that's got bringing back some interesting memories for you in these days. Uh, on the subcommittee on energy and as a congressional fellow to Congressman Ronald V. Dellums. He also served as president of the San Jose Silicon Valley NAACP from 2000 to 2008. And now of course he's president of our state NAACP. So Mr. Callender, you're on. We're, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much and good afternoon and thank you Ms. Watts and thank you to the League for the invitation today. I must admit I was surprised initially when I got the invitation to address the League, but I'm pleased to be with you uh, nevertheless. It, indeed, there's a lot of surprises for us all as we're indeed witnessing and we're living in historic and uncertain times. I feel that, you know, after yesterday, I feel like I have PTSD 
from the past four years of living through open racial hatred, hypocrisy, fears, lies, and deceit. And I'm, I'm thankful to God that those days may be behind us. But when I talk about hypocrisy, I, I want you to imagine this. I'm gonna tell you a story. I want to tell you a story about one entity that was led by an all white staff, which supports things which the traditional environmental and conservation community care about. And we all know that that community is mostly white. Well, that community, they put on the ballot an indefinite measure to successfully manage lands under its jurisdiction. This environmental measure would provide for essential services to the public and prepare additional lands for public access and would allow for that public entity to continue to steward natural infrastructure as a way of combating climate change. Many of the all white led organizations, including yours, environmental organizations and, conversation, and conservation organizations they were happy to support this measure and they were encouraged and they encouraged the passage of the measure. Another entity led by a black man for the first time in his history. And they tried to ensure that they were looking and focusing on environmental justice and putting on a ballot an indefinite measure to successfully manage lands, provide for flood protection, which mostly impacts communities of color. Additionally, this measure would also provide for balanced environmental dollars to all communities and provide for environmental projects in all communities which has never been done before. Now these same white, all white organizations, including yours, many environmental organizations and conservation organizations opposed or stayed neutral on this measure because it was indefinite. Now many communities of color lined up to support this second ballot measure because they felt their voices were finally being heard. They felt for the first time that they would not have to come back every 10 to 12 years and beg for the services which they so desperately needed. And why do I start with this story? Yes, this is the story of Measure S and Measure T, which was on a very ballot that elected Joe Biden and the first African-American woman, Kamala Harris, the vice president. This is the story of environmental injustice. This is the story of what privilege looks like. This is the story of when you look in the mirror, when you look down your list of friends and when you look who you associate with, what causes, what efforts, what, uh, what organizations that you're involved with, what are those memberships? And when you reflect on their things and they only look just like you do in the mirror, and if you look in the mirror and this is that case, you may be missing what racial equity, diversity and inclusion is truly about. As we say in the NAACP, don't talk about it. We want you to be about it. These two issues and the measures that I described are the same in terms of protecting the environment. Both measures have no sunset clauses and are indefinite until repealed by voters. This is what environmental justice injustice looks like. It may be a new day in our nation's capital where facts, truth, and honesty will rule the day. And I hope that locally, when we have those that push the envelope of dishonest environmental injustice, no, I pray actually, I pray that those who are witness to when this is occurring and then these things occur, they will speak truth to power and they will stand up against it. Let me digress in terms of what's going on in our nation's capital right now. Yesterday was a memorable, uh, memorable day for me, not only because it was my son's 24th birthday, but it was the start of a new day and moving towards unity in this country. You know, what happened in the US Capitol building on January 6th will definitely go down in our nation's history's books. If I was to tell you last year that truthfully, we'd be watching an attempted takeover of government by a rogue group of white supremacists joined by a party of conspiracy theorists, would you believe me? You'd probably say, oh, Rick, you're crazy. Well, what we have going on nationally was a campaign of lies and false conspiracies. It was the words which were spoken, which lacked substantive details of proof, which led to this insurrection. I'm not talking about Republican or Democratic ideals. I'm talking about how a takeover of our government from radical idealists and supremacists actually took place. Yes, it's the people who believe that the South will rise again and they were attempting to start another civil war. I'm telling you, we see it right now in the NAACP. We still see it in the threads of conversation. There's an attempt to start another civil war. What was going on with, was an attempt to disenfranchise and to take away the vote of millions of black voters. Go and look what states they were challenging. Go look what cities they were challenging. If anyone questions if the insurrectionists were white supremacists and those trying to get the South to rise again, I'm gonna to point to the fact that the Confederate flag has never enjoyed being flown into our, in our capital till, until January 6th of 2021. I'll point to the fact that many of the insurrectionists were wearing white supremacy identifiers and logos that they used to, when they tried to seize our capital, just like the British did in 1814. 
I will point to the fact that many of the insurrectionists posted their racist rants on social media for all to see. Yes, it was truly about the South rising again. Yes, this is also about race in America. If you don't think that race and privilege is a factor in decisions in America, I'll simply point out this. The obvious enforcement on the, on the ethnically diverse Black Lives Matter protests versus the rioters' rogue group of insurrectionists once again has shown all on live TV that race really does matter. My message to you is this. Yes, the issue of race relations has always been a tough one. The issue of racial inclusion and equality will always continue to be a tough one, especially when it deals with the environment and justice because people of color have not traditionally had their feet planted in that. It's been all white and that's why it's a tough issue. Last week, I told my employees that the skin is what I wear every day is what keeps me aware of the issue of what's happening in our country and how race plays into such things such as the jobs we apply for, how people see us, how they fear us, or even sometimes the air that we breathe. Yes, what we saw was about supremacy, privilege, and, pow and power. Bottom line is what you saw in the Capitol, white privilege on full display. It's that same privilege which makes people see environmental justice differently than others. In the past, and some, and some, to some extent now, when people think of environmentalism, they often think of saving the wells or hugging trees. When people think, when folks think about climate change, it often comes to mind or melting ice, ice caps or suffering polar bears. Historically, American society has failed to make the connection in terms of the direct impact on the environmental injustice, including climate change on our own lives, our own family, and on our own communities all of whom depend on the physical and environment uh, on the physical environment and its bounty toxic facilities like coal powered power uh, coal power plants incinerators emit mercury arsenic lead and other contaminants into the water food and the lungs of communities many of these same facilities also emit carbon dioxide and methane that's the number one and two drivers for climate change at the same time not all communities are equally impacted race even more than class is the number one indicator for the placement of toxic facilities in this country. Communities of color, low-income communities, they're the ones often hardest hit by climate change. Look at our own flooding of 2017. Look at the Rock Springs area. Look at what the demographic of those people look like. This happened in our own community. Environmental injustice is about people in urban cities who have died and other people who are chronically ill due to exposures from toxins from coal fire power plants and other toxic facilities. Climate change, I'm telling you, this is about the increase in the severity of storms, which means that storms like Sandy and Isaac, which devastated communities from Boston to Biloxi, will continue to get more rain than, than the norm. Environmental injustice and climate change are about the fact that many communities, it's easier to find a bag of Cheetos than to find a carton of strawberries. This only stands to get worse as drought and flood impacting and, and floods impact our communities. Long ago, me and a few other folks drove the effort at the national NAACP to get us more involved in environmental justice nationally. This is really is a civil rights issue. Now the NAACP has an environment and climate change program, which works at addressing these many practices that are harming communities in California nationwide and advance a society that fosters sustainable, cooperative and regenerative communities that uphold the rights for all people so we can live in harmony with the earth. Let me assure you of this. We're gonna be making sure our voices are heard. Valley Water and the NAACP under my leadership is going to make environmental justice a statewide priority. At Valley Water, when I became CEO, I started off an office of what we call it the Ready Office. It's the Office of Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion. And these last few months, Valley Water has taken the concrete step to become a more anti-racist and anti-hate organization. We're updating our board's policies to specifically address the commitment to environmental justice and make it an integral part of what we do and how we do it every day. When I promise to talk about envir why environmental justice matters, I'm hoping that you understand why it matters to me. I'm not gonna sit in this seat as CEO or as president of the California Hawaii NAACP and not move the needle as it relates to environmental justice. Yes, it does matter. Let me assure you this, no matter what is happening in our nation, Valley Water, we will not be deterred from our mission, nor will the NAACP be deterred. We won't let the events of the past impact our efforts. After all, the one thing I can tell you this, we're all in this environment and we're all in this world together. We've got to find a way 
to work together to achieve goals that do not leave some people behind while benefiting the privileged. If we can do this, we will all ultimately be okay. Our nation will be okay and we'll be okay locally. Thank you for allowing me to make some brief comments and I'm gonna open the questions. I do know that there's some questions out there. So Vicki, I'll look to you for any questions that you'd like to share. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, mute too. Uh, Vicki, uh, go ahead and turn on your video and um, audio. Also, um, um, I, I, I agree with very much of what you said, Mr. Callender. And um, I, I, it, it, it's so complex when we come with some of the, when we look at some of these issues and to know, and and I hope that we can really talk about the issues uh, and you know, how it affects, but we certainly agree with you that we do not want, we want all people to be treated fairly and to have water and clean water and clean air uh, and everything, it is extremely complex, I think. Um, uh, we don't believe that we were being, that we are insensitive to non-white people when we take positions, we really would try not to. Maybe it would be helpful sometime if uh, uh, you or someone in your organization would look at our positions and give us a, a, a reading on them. I mean, perhaps, maybe there was something unintended in there that we didn't think, but if you, we would be very I would be open. Absolutely if, happy to sit down and have this conversation. You if you would like to do that, we, we would uh, certainly be happy to do that. But next we have some questions and some questions were asked ahead of time and Vicki, Alexander is our uh, the, the on our board of directors and is the chair of the climate change committee. She's the chair of all kinds of things and also our local study uh, co-chair of our local study committee, uh, looking at the governance in San Jose. Vicky, uh, okay. would you ask the first question? Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, I uh, have one that just came in. What specific things will Valley Water do to engage communities of color? Can you be specific? Uh, I understand in California, nearly 1 million do not have clean water. Indeed, I'm gonna start backwards first. Yes, when you talk about 1 million that don't have clean water, that's often you have many communities of color that are drinking poisonous groundwater. And that's real. It's unfortunately, in Santa Clara Valley Water District's territory, we do not have that problem, but it is all throughout the nation. If you look at what happened in not only Flint, Michigan, those things are real. If you look at the people that are receiving dirty water, you know, like I said, many of them look just like me uh, that are receiving. Their skin tone is not white often when they're receiving this kind of polluted water. What can we do at Valley Water to engage communities of color? That's pr exactly why I've started the Ready Office. One of the things that we have to do is we have to make sure when we're engaging the population, it looks like the population for the people that we're serving. Often what I tell people is if you are paying taxes in our community, if you are, if you are drinking our water supply in our community, you should have a voice in how our services are provided in this community. So one of the things that we'll be doing for the Ready Office and we actually have already started doing is trying to engage and working with many different uh, churches. If you, if you know often where the gathering places of where people of color go is to the church community. So we've had a very strong effort in engaging the, the churches. And I think if you look at what happened with Measure S and why Measure S passed by over 75%, I think that it was communities of color that really understood the benefit of what was going on. So we're gonna continue to do that through our ready office, we're gonna to continue to move forward. If you look at even uh, the involvement on our committees, right now, Reverend Moore, the local NAACP, he's the vice chair of, our, of the environmental committee for Valley Water. We take, we take the environment serious in, in all different communities of color. And so what we're trying to do is make sure we're engaging. It's an excellent question. We're gonna to continue to, to move forward and engaging so we can have all voices at the table. Can, can you tell us a little bit more about your ready office? Uh, because people may not be familiar with that and what it does. Yeah, so our, ready, our Office of Racial Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, actually we're still bringing on, board the, um, bringing on board the staff right now. I have one out of four staff that are hired. Um, uh, two of the staff members, fortunately, will be starting on the 25th of this, uh, this month. So I'm very encouraged by the fact that we'll have them on board. Uh, the Ready Office, the first thing that it's gonna be doing is we have, it going, we have our entire organization undergoing an assessment to see how we are doing, not only hiring, not only um, 
cons uh, contracts, uh, but, but engagement to make sure are, are we doing things to, uh, that are leading towards systematic racism? If you look at things in terms of our, uh, how the hiring has been done in past, a lot of times you have implicit bias that is uh, coming through in committees and coming through which are keeping people from getting to the table. So the Ready Office is going to be looking at all of those different things, not only internally, but also what we're doing externally. So that's what the Ready Office will be doing. Okay, thank you. Um, how will you increase cooperation with the city of San Jose and the county on enhanced creek cleanups of homeless encampments? What's being done to protect streams and provide safe alternatives to the homeless persons? Well, that's an excellent question again. Um, that's one of the things that I, I've made a motto of, and, and I've started meeting with all of the Santa Clara County managers to make sure that we can have a more cooperative relationship. I think the battles that we were having um, of past, those have got to go to way. People expect government services to work together. If you call us for a homeless encampment that is on our property or the city's property, often what happens is people feel like they're, you know, they're tossed around in a, in a loop chasing their own tails because uh, we'll point to, oh, that's the city of San Jose, et cetera. I've started off a conversation already with the county executive to say, how do we move towards a more unified, if it's a JPA, I don't know, a joint powers authority or what it may be so that we can have basically a one-stop shop. We have $500,000 that's in measure S since it's passed, that's going to deal with the humane efforts of removing homeless and trying to get people um, out, of, out of the creek. So we're going to continue to do, uh, do our parts in moving, uh, moving folks out of the creeks. We also have uh, security services that are underneath there because we do have, uh, unfortunately, some criminal elements that are in the creek. We have people that, um, I, I tell folks this is a true story. We had two young ladies, uh, literally with uh, fish catching nets that are going out to count fish in the creeks and they were attacked by uh, by a homeless individual um, with a gun. This is this is real. So we do have, and it happens almost daily, almost weekly. I'm getting a report of uh, pit bulls or vicious dogs being sicked on our crews that are just trying to uh, basically go out and take care of uh, take care of the creeks, remove debris <laughs> from from creeks so that we could be prepared. Um, so one of the things that we uh, that we're looking at, like I said, is working with the county um, for a joint effort so that we can have a one stop shop. A kind of effort. I'm hoping that we'll be able to make this happen. Um, what are we going to be doing with that 500,000 for Measure S? We're still in the determination of how that's going to work, but we'll use that process to figure it out. Okay, thank you. Um, a question came in. I'm a newcomer to this subject matter. Could you step back a bit and just mention a bit about the scope of the organization and how many total staff? All right, so scope of the organization. So I'm mixed in two different organizations here. Um, one is the California Hawaii NAACP. I'll start with that because it's much simpler. We are the, the California Hawaii National Association of the Advancement of Colored People. Right now, we have three people on staff. Um, it's the, the traditional effort of, of civil rights, and we oversee all of the 55 branches in the state of California and Hawaii. Um, for the other organization, I sit here in, in, my, in my physical office. I'm the C CEO of the Santa Clara Valley Water District, the uh, Valley Water District provides water, uh, wholesale water supply, environmental efforts, as well as flood protection to the 2 million people in Santa Clara County. Our current staff count is 925 people, or 925 positions. I shouldn't say people because we have people coming in and out and retiring all the time, but we have 925 positions. Okay. So very different uh, scope between the very two organizations. Scope, correct. Okay, uh, please share with us your thoughts on how the times have changed uh, when you first started being active with the NAACP. You, you, you know, it's interesting. I, I tell folks what's old is new because you haven't seen any changes. The, 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 the only thing that's really changed is the fights that I was in for the NAACP. When I started in 2000, if most of you know, we didn't have this kind of cell phones that we had with cameras. So you didn't see things. You wouldn't have seen, you know, the issues of, where people are mortified when they saw the um, the uh, the officer with his knee on the, the neck of George Floyd. You don't so the communication was different. When we were talking about the facts of racial profiling and policing, um, people didn't see it. They were like, ah, oh, do we see it? And so one of the things I think that uh, San Jose moved towards then was basically looking at the stat, uh, looking at the data, and saying, um, does the data say if we're racially profiling or if we're doing things? You know, we were able to see. You know, clearly we got the complaints that when when a black or brown child was stopped and driving in the car, they were asked to curb sit. So basically 
you stop, they, they bring out the car, they make you sit on the curb. If it was somebody, it was a white child, they were treated very, very differently. Now, this is in full, this is in full view. If you see what, what occurred during the, um, during the protests that were happening in the downtown, we had rubber bullets being used on the youth of, that weren't writing, that weren't doing anything, but they were just amassing uh, to talk about basically what happened and, and how the fact that we've been able to see in full view the fact of someone being murdered by an officer. That's really what's changed. What improvements have I seen? Well, I'd like to say that we've seen improvements, but I think the, the efforts of January 6th and trying to raid the Capitol, when people see what actually occurred and they understand that the underbelly of America is full of white supremacists the folks that hate us, people say, does that really exist? Well, now you've seen it in full view. You've seen what we've been battling. That is not just in Washington, D.C. I tell folks, some of those people work for me. Some of those people are in my building. So what's changed? Um, if you look at the city of San Jose, we only have one African-American manager in the entire city of San Jose. If you look at the county of Santa Clara, we, we've, we've uh, gone further back. How do we make sure that we have equal representation in the halls of local governments? Um, how do we make sure that the police reforms are there? The, the, the difference is, is what the calls are calling for now is you have people calling for, and this is in the NAACP, you have people out there calling for defund the police. I have no idea what that means in, in our community. The calls may be different. Environmental justice issues, that's one thing that's changed. Um, I, I think starting to see black and brown people as, as it relates to the environment, that's one of the things that, that have changed. Improvements, I, I'd like to say that I've seen improvements, but I have to tell you, I, I think, and, and maybe it's the last four years of PTSD that I have of what's been going on, I don't feel that we've improved. When, when I sit in my seat as an NAACP leader and I see complaints coming in from out of this, all over the state of things that are just atrocious, in their nature of what's happening to black and brown people, it makes you know that we've got a long way to go. This fight is not over. We've, we've got to do things. When I talked to when I started to talk about environmental justice and different standards being used, but using the same words to support one thing and the same words to oppose something else and the benefits go to communities of color, this is real. So a lot hasn't changed, but the thing is the privilege is now on TV and people are seeing it on live TV, on their flat screens and saying, this is what's happening in America. This is what's happening in America. Right. Um, in your role with Valley Water uh, in government relations, what was your major challenge to deal with um, with issues of equity and what's changing? Uh, role of uh, government relations in terms of issues of equity. So in terms of government relations, part of my job was to make sure that I was securing funding um, as well as legislation that would be beneficial for, uh, for, for basically Valley Water constituents and for Valley Water. So in terms of equity, I, I have to tell you, the, the fights were always trying to make sure that um, Santa Clara County projects were, look at, were looked at as um, being funded and fundable. Uh, so we're battling with projects all throughout the country. So if you look at uh, the Shoreline Flood Protection Project, that was one of the largest battles that we got. Ultimately, we had 185 million given towards um, the shoreline flood protection project and yet we continue to battle for that i'm trying to get other um, other projects funded let's use the uh, this is actually it's a good question because it's making me think back when we when we look at issues like the coyote creek flood protection project that's the one project when i battled with the corps of engineers and they started to, and they said well the benefit cost ratio for this project doesn't add up well let me get translate what that really means for you that means that the poor folks homes don't are is worth as much and so we're not going to invest in this area so what what valley water did is we put money into a local measure to try to try to do our own studies and we're still having that very battle but now with measure s i think we'll be able to fund projects and we don't have to have the battle of whose benefit cost is better but that's what that's one of the things when you talk about equity that's something that really exists out there is that you know the 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 federal government and others want to invest in the communities that are worth more so I'll let you translate what that means in your mind, but this is that's the reality of what we what we battle with. In relation to environmental justice, what is Valley Water doing in addition to hiring more people of color? Um, hiring more people of color is not environmental justice. What we're going to do is make sure we're hiring people that are qualified and that we're reaching out and that our pools or of qualified individuals. Environmental justice isn't about just hiring people of color. Environmental justice is making sure 
that everyone is included in the conversation, making sure that when grants are provided, grants are not just provided to do work along the Los Gatos Creek trails, but not doing the same work along Coyote, where, where, where you have people that are in communities of color. Environmental justice is about making sure that as we are as we're looking at flood protection projects, we're not just doing the flood protection project where the loudest voices are, because that those are the people that could afford to come down to our meetings. Environmental justice is about ensuring that when we are talking about issues of climate change, we're meeting with everyone that's affected uh, um, with, with climate change. Environmental justice is about ensuring that all communities, including the most disadvantaged and disproportionately impacted communities are invited and are at the table and taking in consideration. One of the things that you're gonna be seeing is all of our agenda items, we're going to basically have an environmental justice impact. So when we build projects, we're not just gonna build beautiful projects in one community because that community was involved. We're gonna be building beautiful projects in all communities. So aesthetically, they will have something that makes sure that uh, it helps to beautify the community. And so. One of the things that you'll be seeing is that environmental justice impact and what have we done to um, what have we done to deal with it? Okay, thank you. We're I'm trying to read the questions okay. here. Uh, we're going back to one. Um, she says, thank you for that example, how to provide increased levels of support to help those who are most disadvantaged and rethink how we evaluate cost. Is this now the thinking in all Valley Water does that incorporate thinking of equal, of equity? Uh, yes, like I said, that's going to be the environmental justice impact. So we're moving forward. We're never we're, the, the Corps of Engineers. I'm hoping that we'll be able to continue to partner with them on projects. But if we're using the Corps of Engineers benefit cost ratio for an explanation of which projects we'll be doing, projects like Coyote will never happen. Projects like the um, the Upper Guadalupe, which you know primarily communities of color, never never happen because the benefit cost ratio doesn't um, doesn't add uh, doesn't qualify so so some of these things we'll just have to take on locally but yes that is something that we're going to be looking at and making sure we're moving things forward and it's just specifically through the army corps of engineers that has that lens of of benefit cost yeah well the army corps that well that's how they that's how they look at so if you're going to have a federal partnership with the with the army corps of engineers they'll come in they'll do a study and they'll say does for every one dollar that we put in, you have to have one dollar of benefit. Well, if you're at the Cayuco Creek Rock Springs area, those are all apartments that are over there. You know, they live in this in this bowl, um, and so if those were all single-family, you know, beautiful homes in the Almaden area or some or, or or in the Palo Alto area, the benefit cost would be high because you're protecting the value of those homes. And so that's what that's what you that's what we got to work against. And that's what doesn't that's what doesn't that's not what favors us getting projects done in society. And this is the same uh, BC ratio that and I've been trying to work on this from federal policy. And I'm hoping that under the Biden Harris administration, this is something that they'll look at because it's not just in our community, it's in every community. That's how they look at it. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm trying to go back and make sure I don't skip questions. So this one is, as a black male with a black son, do you worry about police mistreatment locally? League has positions calling for reforms in our criminal justice system. Does this personally touch you and others? Um, as, a, as a black man that grew up in this community and a black man that was stopped uh, many times for driving cars and, it, and for no reason, for no reason, search my car, you know, growing up. Yes, I, I worry. I, I'll give a, a real life example. It was about two years ago, maybe my, my son was home for, uh, uh, it was winter vacation. He went to his school. He actually just graduated from California State University, Chico. Um, which is also my alma mater, um, but someone tried to break into our house. They'd taken off the screen and they'd opened up the window and they were trying to come in. My dog came running down the stairs, barking at them, they took off. And so we called the police and then my son was gonna go outside and put the screen back on. I told him, do not go outside, do not you know, leave that screen off, wait for the police to come. You don't wanna be a black man in this society, um, basically putting a screen on a window and, you don't, and you're scared of what's gonna occur. The, the things that I have to teach my child is different than the things that many of you have to teach your child. Have you had to teach and tell your child that when the police stop you, keep both hands on the, on the steering wheel, make sure, that you, make sure you say exactly what you're doing. These are things that you have to teach black children that you don't have to necessarily teach white children. The fear of having to raise a black child is different than the fear of having to raise other children. I'm going to tell you, it's, it's very scary. So yes, it's, it definitely impacts me. Thank you for that example. Um, 
I have one. Tell us more about the Upper Guadalupe Project. Not familiar with that project. All right, the Upper Guadalupe Flood Protection Project basically is the reach that goes from uh, 280 up to about where the Valley Water Headquarters is. So that is the project. Uh, so if you, um, uh, so it goes into like the, it goes through the Willow Glen area um, all the way down to the Downtown Flood Protection Project. It's a project that right now the Corps of Engineers is doing what's called a general reevaluation report. That general reevaluation report is going to look at the cost benefit of doing the project. Um, their last report said that the project was falling below a 1.0. That means that's the $1 for every $1 in value that you get. Um, the, the problem that you have is you know, on that project, you have definitely some low income neighborhoods that are there and kind of fall over, right? Back into the same problem. I'm hoping that through the, G, the general reevaluation support uh, report that we can look at different reaches of the project. The project is gonna fall below a 1.0 we will say, okay, this tiny reach of the project, maybe we can get the core to fund this reach. And so we can combine and pull together dollars in order to complete that project. Um, the Upper Guadalupe project, if you can recall, maybe it was just two years ago, even, um, uh, the mayor, Sam Licardo, actually was going door to door because that project was, as we or not the project, excuse me, the Guadalupe um, was expected to flood. It didn't, it, was, it came with like two inches of top of bank. It was terrible. Um, but these are the, the, this is a, it's a real project that, really does flood and we do need, we need to get that thing completed. Um, thank you. Um, I work as an administrator in a school. Does Valley Water, <laughs> the screen flipped and I lost it, hang on. Um, does Valley Water have any sort of curriculum that addresses the topic of environmental justice with regards to clean water access that could be shared with teachers and students? Uh, that's actually a really good one. In fact, I've asked for our we have a school team that's out here. And in fact, I was just talking uh, with our lead of the team and asking her uh, about this very thing. So that's one of the things that we're gonna be incorporating in everything that we do. But yes, we will be having topics of environmental justice uh, for school-aged children so people can understand uh, what, it, what it means. But yes, we are in the school still. Okay, thank you. Um, I have um, a comment and then a question following. Uh, first of all, tell Rick thanks for all of his help in the past, helping the league, getting us speakers and resources to help our league members better understand many Valley water projects, such as Almaden Lake, Lake Anderson, et cetera. Plus we are big fans of your mother, Norma, who has attended many league events. And I have to tell my mom hi, because I see her name in the audience. <laughs> Great. And then she follows, uh, what can the league do to support social justice issues that you feel are most are most important locally, such as what Upper Guadalupe? You know, that, that's, a, that's a very good question. What I'll do is I'll reach out to Rachel Gibson, who is our head of our government, I mean, our head of external affairs, and, and make sure that we're engaging the league um, in some of these conversations. I think well, we need to be speaking louder locally. Um, to not only to Washington, D.C. and others about the, these kind of projects. We can't just allow for people to say the cost-benefit ratio excludes the fact that the government should, uh, the federal government should be involved. That's a, and so I think if the league was to engage in those kind of conversations and basically be pushing those kind of policies, I think it's an important voice to have at the table. I think that would be very helpful. I, we would like that. And I have to tell you, I have a, a from Norma Callender, a high back son. So I share that with you. Um, beneficial uses of water is a longstanding principle in water law in California. Do you see changes in how this is interpreted given concerns about degradation of watersheds and demands for water by urban populations? Yeah, that was a, it's a very interesting question. Many of you may not know. Um, I am attorney. Um, one of the things I emphasized in, in terms of my emphasis in law school was election law, employment law, and water law. So I learned a lot about the beneficial use of water and in terms of um, how the beneficial use of water is looked at through, through the law. So, so um, do I see changes in the interpretation coming in through the law? Probably not. This has been long, long standing law um, in terms of what we can do as long as you're using uh, water for the benefit of what's there, can we use more water for the benefit of the environment? Well, I, I can tell you right now, I believe that's the beneficial use of water. I think what you're gonna be seeing from me is, is definitely a lot more um, environmental uses from, from water supply. Um, I, I believe that these are things that I'd like to see in this valley. One of the things that I'm pushing for, for many of you 
that know we have a, a face effort, it's called Fishery Aquatic. Um, uh, I can't think what the acronym is for, but basically it's how do we provide more water for fish. I think we should be doing these things. We, we, we control the access to water. We've got to find the balance. We've got to find the balance of water for not only the environment, but also water for people. As we sit here right now, and we had the hottest day on January 18th that, um, of record. If you look at the last two times when we've had uh, of record of beating days on January 18th, those are both years of a drought. So I think we're headed into a drought right now, but we've got to be able to balance the beneficial use of water. And with Anderson Dam being completely empty right now because we're trying to rebuild it, it's going to take us 10 years. We're going to be buying water more on the open market. I just directed our staff today, or yesterday rather, to make sure that we're putting enough dollars in the budget so that we can be uh, purchasing water on the open market. I don't want it to be said that oh, we weren't prepared for it. We, we didn't think that we're in a drought, so we didn't have enough money budgeted to purchase water on the open market. And then we're calling for some kind of drastic or draconian um, uh, measures in terms of, uh, in, in terms of uh, people doing conservation. So beneficial use of water, yes, the longstanding principle, we can, we, can, we can balance both and make it work. Thank you. Uh, we continue to question the plans for the Delta Tunnel and Valley Water support. Is this support furthering environmental justice? Oh, that's a, that's a very good question. So if you look at the tunnels and who's receiving the water that's going to be coming from the tunnels, and I'll tell you that the NAACP, the state NAACP, has a position of support on the tunnels. That's because the major urban um, receivers of that water supply are communities of color. So if you look at where the largest communities of color and who are receiving water from the tunnels, yes, that's exactly what's there. Should we not be able to have them have guaranteed supply of water in these, in these, in these major urban communities? And so they have to pay more for water. That is environmental justice. You got to look at both sides of this. How do you balance the environment? And how do you also balance the fact that, you know, that people of color shouldn't be the ones having to hold the burden of everything else within the state? So yes, this, it does have an environmental justice aspect to it. Um, however, I think that the tunnels are probably going to blow themselves up, to be very frank with you, as we look at the cost. It, it, infrastructure costs always blows everything up. If you look at the um, if you look at Pacheco, and I, I know there's probably questions of Pacheco, Pacheco went from $1 billion to $2.5 billion. That's not just from, uh, it wasn't just from, oh, we didn't notice. It's just as you start to study things, as you start to look at being able to put in place infrastructure, uh, what happened in, in Pacheco, deeper excavations after we do those to, uh, to reach the dam foundation, we figure out now we got to go deeper. And then we see that the, even the timeline moves from five to eight years to build a project that's going to actually work. Um, as we as we do some of the borings and we discover, oh, there's seismically uh, unstable uh, unstable um, soil within this area. So as you look at any project, including the Delta tunnels, once they start doing the borings, once they start looking at this, the costs are going to increase. And at what point does it go topsy turvy? Well, if you're looking at Pacheco, it may be there. We're going to be trying to get in dollars uh, for Pacheco. We got a 485 million dollar grant from the state. We're going to go after federal funding. Um, uh, the way that we're going to fund it is through water rates, and at some point, you know, things don't balance out. So you've got to figure out what, how, when does it make sense, and, and when does it not make sense. The Delta tunnels, they may not balance out. It may look like Pacheco ultimately when everything is said and done. Instead of built storage, can conservation be more encouraged? <laughs> um, well, we are going to call for um, conservation is going to is always encouraged. Um, right now we have a 20% voluntary conservation. I've asked for my staff to start um, moving towards uh, having a conversation with our water, um, not our water storage committee, uh, basically our, our water demand committee. And they are probably, and we're gonna be recommending probably looking at mandatory conservation in larger levels of mandatory conservation if the board indeed wants to go there. But like I said, as I look outside right now, as we all sit here and it feels like spring weather, we are supposed to be in the, in the wettest days of the month. This is where we pick up all of our water supply and we have an empty Anderson. We have, yes, we have full groundwater aquifers. However, we've got to make sure that we're looking at um, conservation all the time. Conservation, will not, there's not enough conservation to conserve our way out of needing extra supply. So we've got to really look at both. One of the things that Measure S also contains is for stormwater capture. And I think we're going to have to start having a serious conversation about trying to do a lot more stormwater uh, capture and looking at some other uh, other methodologies. I, I, I don't know that storage is possible um, uh, in the state. Pacheco is, uh, is, we'll continue to look at it, but I'm not sure if it's going to be able to ultimately be said and done. 
we'll see. We're, we're, we're going to look at every way to make it work. And if it doesn't, we'll, we'll look at something else. Okay, well, that, that runs right into this question. Pacheco Reservoir is projected to be a huge capital cost. Based on current estimates, what's the cost of the project? Who's 2.5, yeah. Yeah, you had just said that. And who is projected to pay for this and how will the funds be collected? Okay, so who's, uh, so Pacheco would be part of our water rates. Um, so we put it in our water rate projections uh, looking out. Um, the board just had a very tough conversation when we talked, we just brought it to the board uh, two weeks ago when we talked about what the cost was and what we're looking at. I'm gonna tell you the 2.5 billion, just like all infrastructure projects, as you start to explore more and more and more, generally cost for infrastructure goes up. You never see costs for public infrastructure go down. This is just the reality of what we're looking at. Um, who would be paying for it? So it'd be a combination of water rates, a $485 million grant from the state. We may be able to achieve additional dollars from the state and wind funding. But for all of these different things, one of the things that even for water supply projects, they do look at the cost benefit ratio as well. And so in order to get the wind funding from the federal government, they will also look at the cost benefit of a, of a water supply project and should they invest in it. So, and Pacheco may just be coming because what you're looking at is the yield, the amount of water supply that we create for the cost to build it. And so that's, when, that's what turns that one topsy-turvy. Then uh, going back to the Delta project, happy to hear that perhaps the Delta project may implode. Absent that, what can be done for provision of ensuring water supply? So it's an excellent question. That's one of the things I just talked with our staff today. Not only are we looking at um, water on the open market, we're looking at additional investments into Los Vaqueros Reservoir, as well as right now, there's gonna be a study to uh, basically look at um, um, uh, the San Luis, uh, San Luis Reservoir, I can't even think of the, uh, the name of the reservoir, um, BF Cist, um, uh, at raising that one. So that's going to be something the federal government's going to look at. And then we're going to have to look at groundwater banking um, opportunities throughout the state as well. And how do we, um, how do we uh, achieve some additional groundwater banks so that we can um, even get through the Anderson time? So these are things that we're all looking at. Um, Sites Reservoir is another one that we're keeping our pinky toe in. Um, that may also be able to provide for some water supply. But yes, we've got to basically be able to find uh, pools of water supply throughout the state um, that will continue to keep us prosperous as a valley and, and not have us in a situation of where, it, um, where it affects the economy because we haven't been able to secure or find water supply. To what extent will the district be investing in bioswales and other green approaches to recapture water before flowing to the bay? All right, that's, a, that's interesting. So that was kind of the stormwater capture uh, question that I had. And I think that's one of the things that we were looking at through Measure S and we added in for the ability to move uh, for, towards stormwater capture. I do believe that we're going to start looking at that seriously um, and probably in, in short order as if Pacheco, moves off, if Pacheco moves off the table, the only other choices we have is uh, investments in other local storage supplies. Um, building up one of our own reservoirs, which may not make sense, or raising one of our own reservoirs, which may not make sense, but we've got to look at stormwater capture um, as a very serious thing. And I think that's uh, with now with Measure S and the ability to look out into the future, that's something that we're definitely going to be exploring. Can you say more about the condition of groundwater and aquifers here? Are they in good shape? At one time we overused and caused groundwater to drop. And cause the ground to drop. So that's called subsidence. So when subsidence occurs, is when you overpump, um, you overpump, and literally the, the 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 ground actually sinks. And that's what happened in the Alviso area. So you saw 13 feet of subsidence as a result of overpumping during the um, during the old farming days. Um, so in terms of the conditions of groundwater, we are that's one of our responsibilities as an agency to ensure that we are recharging the groundwater so that you do not see subsidence. Right now, our, our groundwater is, we're looking at from measure, we're pretty much about 100% in terms of our, our groundwater, percent, our, our groundwater in, in terms of um, having, um, so our, our groundwater and our aquifers, really good shape. We're gonna to continue to, you know, continue to monitor those and continue to um, pump. And as we get into a drought, uh, a drought level condition, that's where you'll start to see additional pumping of the groundwater. And that's why we're gonna to have to find additional imported supply um, in order to bring in our additional groundwater banking or trading in order to deal with our Anderson, our Anderson problem. Anderson right now is at uh, three has 3% of capacity, has 3% full. So basically it's empty. You can't go below 3%. Can you please talk more about the cost benefit analysis that affects grant funding? 
Um, cost, so grant funding, so it depends the cost benefit of what you're talking about. So if you're talking about the cost benefit for a water supply project, the way that the Bureau of Reclamation will look at it is the cost of what they're investing, the cost of building the project for the yield of how much water will be, will be, will be obtained. So if the, if the cost of, if, if you're looking at a cost for, you know, billions and billions and billions of dollars to build a project, and then the yield is so small that you it, it doesn't make sense to build the project, that's what turns the cost benefit ratio upside down for water supply project. For the Corps of Engineers, if you're looking at, and it's, um, if you're looking at flood protection projects, they'll look at the, the benefit of what they are protecting versus the cost. And that's where you get this environmental injustice that's coming in. Because if you have a bunch of beautiful um, you know, businesses or, or, or homes that are of high value, you're gonna have a higher benefit cost ratio for that project than if you have a bunch of apartments, um, homes that uh, people are just renting from. It's completely different. It's, it's completely wrong. Interesting. I wasn't aware of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you. Um, unlike many counties, most of our water is urban and for drinking. Can you say more about agricultural water use and their low rates? What factors affect how we charge farmers? Oh, that's a good, uh, that's a really good question. So most of our ag is in South County. We do have a little bit of ag in North County. Um, the, our agricultural water rates are less than that of um, uh, of uh, then our municipal and industrial supply rates. Currently, the agricultural rates, they pay, I uh, wanna say right now, they're paying about 10% of, of what the municipal and industrial rates are. So they do get uh, less rates. Our district act basically calls for, this is the act that was enacted by the legislature. We can never charge them more than 25% of the industrial, of the municipal industrial rates. So, they, so the agricultural does get a additional a benefit. If you talk from the agricultural standpoint, they're going to say that we are providing um, groundwater benefits because the water that we're putting is going on open land, open space. So, so they are providing natural recharge benefits. And so that could have been how the legislature looked at it many, many moons ago when this was put into our act more than, you know, probably I think it was 90 years ago when it was put into our act that way. But, uh, but the reality is, is that agriculture does get a lower rate than the municipal and industrial. Okay, interesting. Um, would we increase recycling water like Orange County is doing? Yes, right now we're in negotiations with the city of San Jose and the city of Santa Clara uh, for to, to build another recycled water plant, another advanced purified uh, water plant. We're negotiating, we've completed negotiations with the city of Palo Alto and Mountain View for, uh, to build a facility there. And we're entering into negotiations in probably February of this year with Morgan Hill, Gilroy um, on the same issue, to figure out how we can expand recycled water into those areas. And we, and we're right now we're keeping on hold a potential with Sunnyvale um, to also enter into negotiations with them. But we will be, um, I'm hoping that we will have an EIR out this year, um, this calendar year. Uh, for one of the for one of these plants that we'd like to do. My hope is it would be San Jose's because that would be the where we get the largest bang for our buck in terms of capacity. Okay. Um, what three things should every one of us do to conserve water? And what three things should we look at regarding environmental justice? Uh, so so in terms of things I think you should do in terms of uh, Conserving water. This is what, what I, when I talk to classroom, they tell them turn off your, you know, turn off your sink when you're brushing, uh, when you're brushing your teeth. Make sure if you're washing your car, you're using a bucket. And you're not just letting the hose, you know, the hose run out. And make sure that your homes um, have uh, have basically the low flow shower heads, the low flow aerators on your on your faucets, and et cetera. And I, I think those are little things. And for those of you that still have those old classic, you know, big flow toilets, get rid of those things. Toss those things out and, and get a low flow toilet. Um, in terms of what three things should we look at regarding environmental justice, I, I think it's not just three things to look at. I think when you, and that's why I'm going to have the environmental justice as part of each and every agenda item. I think when you're looking at environmental justice, when, you, when you're working at the water, watersheds or everything, environmental justice should be taken into, into effect. We shouldn't be building uh, flood protection projects in one community, like, like I said, are beautiful, but in another community, we're not trying to, you know, nobody said that they wanted a beautiful project. Yes, yeah, because it's a working class community. They don't have time to get out. So when, when I'm talking about is 
what are things what are things that we're looking at environmental justice i'm going to say when you're touching anything at the environment if you're talking about water conservation environmental justice should be part of your uh, part of your lexicon when you're talking about um, anything dealing with the environment you shouldn't be you shouldn't be separating the two in terms of what are we doing for the environment and, and are we looking at environmental justice this should be one conversation we should not have a conversation of where environmental justice is off the table okay thank you um there um redistricting is being considered um how would it be implemented oh so redistricting so redistricting is you know after the um after every 10 years every entity that has districts should be looking at uh, redistricting redistricting when you're looking at redistricting is there's a basis of um, you know, population that's there. You want to make sure that you're not cracking any communities. So we talk about environmental justice, not necessarily environmental justice, but this is these are these are issues of voting and how people get to vote on their on whoever is going to be elected. So in terms of what's moving forward, we're uh, re making a recommendation of putting together a redistricting committee, as we've had in past. They're going to be they'll get all the information once we get it in from the census, how many people in what districts. And then we'll look at it. And when we look at it, we want to make sure that we're looking at not cracking communities or, or you know, uh, or splitting communities uh, in terms of their voting power. So, so there's a lot of things that you look at when you're doing redistricting, but you don't want to uh, crack natural communities um, to disenfranchise. Okay. Um, in the new Valley Water Climate Change Policy, will greenhouse gas emissions from pumping imported water be counted? I don't know the answer to that. Um, as we are putting it together, I think that's something that we should probably be we should probably be looking at. There are, you know, you know, the, the reality is this pumping does have greenhouse gas emissions. And so I think that's something that we should absolutely be considering. But I don't know specifically if that's been part of our discussion. Um and just a final um, one that I see. Um, district officials serve continuously over many terms. Are term limits being considered? Uh, term limits are currently in place. Um, we're, we're, uh, we're always, ex uh, term, term limits are, are currently in place with the, the new 15 year measures. We may wanna look at this again to say, do, do the terms to the terms, make sure they match the measures so that we can have some consistency and make sure projects are done. What I'd hate to do is have us put projects in place that are um, then you know you have a new board that comes in. Oh, we're going to do something different. <laughs> so you know we got to do things within our uh, within our act. And uh, sometimes I've seen projects you got to rob Peter to pay Paul. And this is exactly what I saw. Uh, unfortunately, the people on Upper Penitentia after the people on Coyote flooded, they pulled the money from the Upper Penitentia project and gave it to the folks on Coyote. Well, the people on Upper Penitentia they also need that that project. And so what you want to do is have some consistency. But we do have term limits currently in place. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I think, the, Carol, those are all the questions I have. I, what, I hope I didn't miss any. No, oh, I didn't see any that you missed. Thank you very, very much. And thank you so much, uh, Rick Callender, for speaking with us this, this afternoon. We really appreciate your input, and we hope that we can continue to work together. I look forward to it. Okay, wonderful. Um, I just want to say that in uh, one month, uh, on the third Thursday of February, we are going to have Michelle Liu speak with us. She is the CEO of Health Trust, and she will be speaking on a shot in the arm, uh, the COVID-19 challenges and responses in hard hit communities. So we hope to see you all there. So thank you all very much for coming. And I hope to see you next, next time. Bye-bye.